paint, but we'll start the 500 mile walk today. Uh, uh, over the next three weeks, uh, from uh, Porty uh, or, or Sky, uh, like uh, through 70 different towns and villages, uh, 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 meeting up about 106 different yes groups, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we're going to arrive on uh, the, the, the all under one banner Edinburgh march uh, on uh, the 6th of October. First of all, could I ask you about the, your reaction to the UK government's uh, agriculture bill and the impact on Scottish farming? We have very real concerns at what is going on with agriculture and I have to say the UK government's got form. Um, if we go back to 2013, the European Commission granted Scotland additional funds because they recognised that we have a very low level of support for hill farmers and crofters in Scotland, the so-called convergence money. It's supposed to be 230 million of euros coming to the UK over a four-year period between 2016 and 2020. We knew that the vast bulk of that money should come to Scottish crofters and farmers. What has happened is that Scotland is getting 16.5% of it. I mean, I would put this quite simply to you, that this is money that Europe has intended to come to Scotland, that Westminster has withheld. I think that really demonstrates quite clearly that we can't trust Westminster to look after our farming and crofting interests. And I think there is some real concern now we've had the withdrawal bill that's gone through Parliament that we know that Westminster has taken back control of areas of agriculture that should sit with our Parliament here in Edinburgh. I would far rather see our Parliament in Edinburgh have full responsibility for all agricultural matters, but there isn't that clarity with the agricultural bill which has come forward. So there are some concerns that we have there. We need to make sure that we have a climate and environment that people want to become involved in crofting and farming. We're here in the Isle of Skye and I can tell you that over the course of the last few years the number of people that are active crofters has declined. Uh, we need to make sure that people are supported properly and I would trust a Scottish government to do that, not a government in Westminster. You might have seen that the NAFU have uh made a complaint to the BBC um, regarding um, inaccuracies and misreporting on their disclosure programme uh, regarding the dark, dark side of dairy. Uh, what did you make of that? Well, I, I mean, I think it's right that the NFU have raised what are legitimate concerns. I think issues of animal husbandry is something that people are very concerned about. I mean, I get an awful lot of emails from people very concerned about that issue. What I would say is that I, I am a crofter myself. I have, I have sheep and all of us that have and animals have got a duty of care for these animals. We want to make sure that they are properly looked after. And I think there is a case that the film has exacerbated concerns that animals have not been looked after properly, that in this particular case that um, the impression was created that, that the animals were being transported over long distances into North Africa without any uh, due concern that was given to their, to their welfare and livelihood. And we know that that's not the case. That was an erroneous picture that was presented. I would simply say that when we're discussing these matters, it has to be factual and evidence-based. And the NFU are right to raise these issues with the BBC. The High Court have found that um, there's been uh, three breaches of the law by the Vote Leave campaign um, and uh, that the Electoral Commission itself uh, was given erroneous advice. Um, can I have your views about that? I think the Electoral Commission have got some answers to give, some explaining to do. I mean, the backdrop to this is that we know that Vote Leave were fined because they 
uh, didn't adhere to the rules, the regulations, the laws that are there. But we also now know that the Electoral Commission have not made sure that vote leave were given the correct advice through this whole process. We need to know that when people vote, that there's a level playing field. We need to know that there's fairness there, that everybody has been treated the same. And this unfortunately does create the impression that the Electoral Commission have not been fit for purpose in the way that they've handled the EU referendum in 2016. So questions have to be asked, but it's not just about vote leave, it's not just about the Electoral Commission, that we have to remember the impact of people such as Cambridge Analytica. Um, so there's a whole issue here. And if I may say so, we've also got the situation uh, in Scotland with the, the dark money, the allegations which have been took to the Conservative Party that simply haven't been answered properly. So we need to make sure that the public can have faith and full trust in the political process. And the Electoral Commission has certainly not helped in making sure that we can deliver that transparency, that fairness and that trust that people need. Can we now move on to the Boundary Commission um, uh, regarding the proposed boundary uh, changes? Well, I think there is real concern and an outrage indeed in many parts of Scotland from the proposals which have now been laid in front of Parliament. The proposals have been laid, but we don't know when the government's going to bring them forward and have a vote on them. And I suspect that is because they're, they're concerned that they won't get the, the measures through. And I hope that they can't get them through, but we'll have to wait and see. But the implications for Scotland, I think, are pretty severe. Uh, Scotland would go down from 59 to 53 constituencies and I think there is a real issue about a democratic deficit. We shouldn't be cutting MPs for Scotland that need to go down and make sure that we're standing up for constituency. We should be looking at the unelected House of Lords where there are more than 800 members of that chamber. That's what we should be looking at, not looking at cutting the number of MPs. Now when we then consider the impact that this will have and we're here in the Isle of Skye, so the, the seat that I represent currently, Ross Sky and Loch Haver, is already by far and away the biggest uh, in Parliament. It is 12, it's over 12,000 square kilometres. So it takes me four hours to travel this constituency north to south. It goes from the west coast of Scotland to the east coast. So if I give you the example of this week, we're on recess. But on Monday, I'm going to go to Noidart, which is a fairly isolated community, but it's important that I visit people there that I do in other parts of the constituency as well. That's a two-ferry journey for me to get to Noidart for a one-hour surgery. It will take most of the day. I value the opportunity of doing that. But it's very different from people in, a, in an inner-city constituency that may have surgeries in a constituency office, and perhaps that will be the limit of what they do. Then on Tuesday, I'm hosting five... Uh, surgeries uh, in various parts of my constituency, doing the same on Wednesday and Thursday. And it means over the course of next week I'll actually only be at home one night because I can't logistically get round, come home. I've got to do that whilst I'm on the road and make sure I'm getting round as many places as possible. So next week I'm off to Bewley, to Muravord, uh, to Dingwall, uh, to the island of Rasi, to... Um, uh, I'm going to Kishorn, uh, I'm going to Lochabn and so on and so forth. But these places are very, very far apart. Mm -hmm. And people in those places need to know that they have access to the Member of Parliament, that the Member of Parliament will be coming and having surgeries. Now, if these proposals go through, we're going to come down from four Highland seats to three. And it means that what is getting on for 45% of the land mass of Scotland is going to be represented by three constituencies. That's not right. It's not right that people in what are remote communities don't have the same rights of access that people have in other parts of Scotland and indeed other parts of the United Kingdom. So I'm simply saying to the, the UK government, you must stop this. You, you must make sure that there is accountability for all our communities through Scotland and we cannot disenfranchise people the way that we're doing with these boundary changes. It would be, I'd go as far to say, it would be a disaster for the rural areas to see these boundary changes go through and people not have that effective representation. Yes, the uh, day of action is on the 29th of September, I believe. Well, one of the things I think is important is that we need to have a conversation with the, the people of Scotland. If, if I go back to the referendum in 2014 here in the Isle of Skye, we had 70 public meetings around this area. I think it was, was one of the reasons why the island of Skye voted yes to independence in 2014. So in that context, the SNP calling a day of action throughout Scotland it's very, very important. And I would say to 
SNP members, those that are supporters of independence, let's make sure that we're getting on the doorstep, that we're listening to people, we're talking with people, and we're having that debate about Scotland's future. Let's show that we can win the hearts and the minds. And when the time does come for that independence referendum to happen, the hard work of engaging with people in a respectful manner will be what will lead us to winning that referendum. Finally, you've been um, reported in the press this week regarding the timing for the Scottish Government to make decisions on um, our own referendum. Um, I think you, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I've, I've been in the SNP ever since a teenager, and the reason I joined the SNP, I guess, like every other member, is because I want to see Scottish independence, and I want Scottish independence to happen as quickly as possible. Um, but you look at everything which goes on at Westminster, the democratic deficit, the fact that the poor are punished by austerity, um, everything which has gone on about the denying of the rights to women of a, a certain age, their pension rights, and so far, so, so, so far and so on. I mean, there are so many things that would make us angry as to how we're governed in Scotland today. And I know that if we have independence, that we will have a fairer, we'll have a more prosperous Scotland. And I want that to happen as soon as is practically possible. What I would simply say is that what the First Minister has put across is we need to know what the destination of Brexit is going to be. We have a mandate from the people of Scotland through the elections to the Scottish Parliament in 2016. And once we know the outcome of Brexit, we can sit down and we look at what should be the constitutional opportunities for the people of Scotland. I think what we should be doing today, what we are doing, the First Minister said in her conference speech to the SNP way back in June, that we should be discussing the why of independence. And I'm delighted that here in Sky today we've seen off a, a group of walkers that are going on a 500 mile walk through Scotland, arriving in Edinburgh on the 6th of October. As much as anything else, that's about that opportunity to engage with people whilst they're on that journey, on Scotland's journey towards independence. I know that we will have that opportunity to vote uh, on Scotland's future at some point. I look forward to that happening and I look forward to Scotland becoming an independent nation. I know it will.